All right, so you all come on in and take a seat. Let me kind of give you all a little bit of an overview of what's going to be taking place tonight. Tonight is going to be our night of vision, and we are specifically focused on joining in God's kingdom activity, what it is that God is doing around the world. So tonight I have four main goals that I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, that is to remind, to inform, to challenge, and then to pray. So here's what I mean by those. Uh, to remind, I want to remind everyone that if we are to be about the mission of Christ, making disciples of all the nations, then we have to live with a kingdom mindset. Um, it is absolutely imperative. The kingdom of God is bigger than one church, one denomination, one country. Um, as my friend Vance Pittman so wonderfully put it, the kingdom is God's, listen to this, sovereign activity in the world resulting in people being in right relationship with himself. That's going to mean that it's going to include what God is doing in churches, what God is doing in parachurch organizations, what God is doing through individual believers as they are living as salt and light. It's going to include all of those. So I want to remind people about the importance of kingdom, a statement that I've shared multiple times. It's not about our church. It's about his kingdom. Also, to inform um, I want you all to know just a little bit about what God is doing all around us, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. So the group that I have up on the stage with me, and they're going to all introduce themselves in just a moment, this group is representing part of what God is doing in one or more of those particular areas. I want you to hear about that. Um, also to challenge I want to challenge every single born-again child of God in this room to recognize if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been called to make disciples. The calling of God does not just come to someone who is, quote, a pastor or a missionary. The calling of God comes to teachers, it comes to factory workers, it comes to business leaders, it comes to military personnel, it comes to stay-at-home moms, it comes to students, it comes to farmers, it comes to everyone. If you are a follower of Christ, you are called to make disciples. And then the last part is I want us to know how we can pray more effectively. So you're going to hear at the end of the evening how it is that you can specifically join in prayer, not only with those who are on the stage right now, but there's also going to be another group who you're going to hear from tonight that is coming in through video. And these are other mission partners of Sherwood. So a lot that's going to be taking place this evening. So without any further ado, if you all would just welcome the group to the stage right now. All right, so here's what I want to do. I want each person, and we're going to start with Ms. Jules here. Um, I want each person to just kind of share just a moment as far as name, the organization that you're with, sentence or two about what it is that you do, and also just a general idea of where in the, the broad scheme of things in the world you are serving. So we're going to start with you, Jules. Um, my name is Jules. I work with the International Mission Board and the Northern mountains of Thailand with an unreached people group. Um, my focus is on the teaching of the Bible to children and on the discipleship um, of a group up on a mountain. They make um, ornaments as a way to supplement their income. And then another focus, only because I've been in Thailand for two years, is to continue to learn the Thai language well. So that's about me. Awesome. I'm Doug Derbyshire. My wife Cheryl and I have been in Thailand with the International Mission Board since 1992. I run Bangkla Baptist Clinic. I have uh, 25 Thai nationals that work with me, and we seek to heal the sick and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and bring people to faith right around us there in central Thailand and bring people to faith all over the country. Wonderful. My name is Samuel Ayala, and um, I serve with the Georgia Baptist Mission Board as a mission consultant um, in the west central region, southwest and southeast, almost half the state. And um, our role is just to encourage and come alongside of pastors and churches uh, to see them being on mission with God, according to Acts 1-8. Good. Good. Many of you know my name is John LaGrange. For those of you that don't, I'm the director of This is the Gospel here at Sherwood. I oversee the leadership of Global Missions. 
here as well. And, you know, I get the opportunity to partner with the ministries here at Sherwood, but also with local churches and national partners and international partners in strengthening them in their discipleship efforts so that we can reach the nations. Well, good evening. My name is Ken Bevel. Go to one of the best churches in the world. <laughs> Pastor of Connections and Local Missions here. Uh, I've been in Sherwood for 12 years on staff. And uh, one of my unique purpose, uh, responsibilities is myself, along with multiple staff members and multiple volunteers, is to help mobilize the church to help share the gospel, to make disciples, and to help love on this community locally. And so I'm excited to do what I do. I love doing what I do, and I just pray that we will continue to Hear more about that tonight. All right. So hopefully you all have heard and understand, like we've got international, we got regional, we got state, and also have uh, those local right here. So now if you would, turn your attention to the screens, and we've got some others who will be introduced. Hi, Sherwood. My name is Michael May. I've been serving for the last 16 or 17 years here in Europe for a sports ministry called News Release. I also work here as a professional basketball coach in Germany. And I'm Linda May, Mike's wife. I'm an occupational therapist and a social worker. You may have heard about us. About a year and a half ago, we started a, a new ministry in Africa, specifically Zambia for now. And um, this last summer, we actually had the, the privilege of working with two of your best and brightest, John and Patrick. We'll let you decide which one of those is the best and which one of those is the brightest. But we are just so thankful for Sherwood for allowing um, John and Patrick to work with us. It's been a huge blessing in um, helping us set a vision and moving this ministry forward. Mike and Cherry Peachy here in Madang, Papua New Guinea, serving with Ethnos 360, helping to reach unreached people groups in remote parts of Papua New Guinea. My role here is managing the day-to-day -day operations of this center, doing basic maintenance on vehicles and housing, and also buying supplies and helping get them loaded into a helicopter or airplane. Uh, my role here on center is taking care of housing and guest housing for missionaries uh, traveling through country or leaving country or for those that are coming on a, a week or two week break. Hello, family of God. How are you? I'm, I'm the Stella Angana. Uh, I'm the founder and director of Ambaricho International Prayer and Mission Movement. I am sitting with Josh Wilson. He is the lead pastor at Storyline Church in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, we just get a chance to sit down and just talk a little bit about what God is doing and how it is that we can best partner and pray together with them. So, uh, yeah. one, great to have you. Thanks, um, and just an opportunity to be able to talk with the people of Sherwood a yeah, little bit. Yeah, it's a joy. Yeah, grateful for you all. I am sitting here right now with Virgil Brown. He is the lead pastor at Redemption Church in Portland, Oregon. And we get a chance to not only partner together with this ministry, a church plant, but also get a chance to be able to sit down and just hear a little bit about what God is doing in his life, the family, uh, the life of the church, and also what's taking place right here in Portland. So... Without any further ado, thank you for being willing to sit down with this man. Excited about uh, our conversations, some things that are happening right here with Redemption Church. My pleasure. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So you can see we got church planters, we got mission leaders, we've got local missions leaders, we got people all across the board who are being represented. So at this point, I am going to start directing some questions. Some of these will go to specific individuals, and some will go to the entire group. Um, but this first one, I'm actually going to direct it. We're going to start with Pastor Ken, and this will also come to Jules and also Dr. Doug. Um, and here's the question that I'd love for you all to answer. Um, it, each of you take a couple of minutes and just share how you are meeting tangible needs in the community. And how do you leverage what could be considered common connections for the sake of the gospel? And when I talk about common connections, I mean common interests, common needs, common concerns, those types of things. So I'm going to start with Pastor Ken. Well, Pastor, we are uh, oh, <laughs> hot, coming in hot. Uh, we are meeting uh, some tangible needs in our community. And church, you have been phenomenal. 
the Lord has given us some great opportunities to be able to reach people, and we reach people in a number of ways. The first way is with our serve days. You have done phenomenal jobs serving people, going out helping people, but also there are five tangible ways that we normally assist people. And the first is help, uh, hope for education. And we utilize, utilize that through Bible studies for men and women, and then also our life skills class. Hope for community evangelism. On Wednesday nights, we go out and share the gospel in some very, very difficult areas with men and women. And so we're seeing a number of people come to Christ, come off the street, because you are faithful enough to go out and share the gospel and serve in that area. And then also hope for families. Uh, we do some special things. And, and Dan, would you please go ahead and roll that video of uh, help for families? You go that way. You go that way. You go that way. Amen. These are children <laughs> in our community through your service and your giving and your prayers that are getting beds for the very first time. We're doing that here locally through our church, reaching the community, and the Lord is blessing that. Many of you went out yesterday and delivered deliver beds. I think we delivered about 12 beds yesterday to uh, 11 different families, and so the Lord is blessing that. In addition to that, hope in crisis with debris removal, and then also hope for restoration, men and women that are getting out of prison. We're helping them get their life back on track, making sure they get jobs, IDs, and different things like that. We're using all those things to impact with the gospel. Wonderful. So Jules, how about you? Um, so just to give some context, the Unreached People Group I work with in the northern mountains of Thailand, a lot of them have fled from a neighboring country because in the country that they're born in, there's war, there's abuse. Um, boys are put in the army at a young age. And so whenever we get them in Thailand, usually because they've crossed a border, there's no identification. There's, they don't have much opportunity for, to get a job. And so we partnered with um, Cheryl, Dr. Doug's wife. She runs an organization called Thai Country Trim that sells ornaments um, in Europe and also in America. And people in Thailand make them, and it's a, a way for them to supplement their income. And so we started a group up on the mountain, and we make ornaments. But a key part of that group is every time we get together, the foundational piece that we laid in the very beginning was we're going to worship first, and we're going to study God's word. So it doesn't matter who comes, that's the foundation piece that's always first. And so that's a common connection that we've used to help them supplement their income, but also to share the gospel. In fact, when we first started, there was these three believing women, we would say, would you, they were kind of new believers and we would ask them, do you wanna pray? And they were like, no, like we cannot pray. No, that is not on the table. And um, we have been doing this group for about a year now and they're at the point now where they'll pray boldly and they're asking other people to pray. Actually this weekend, we, they had a Thanksgiving celebration. Their Thanksgiving takes place in October. And two of those three women stood in front of 100 plus people and sang worship songs. Hmm. And so, those are just some connections that we're leveraging to not only help them and supplement their income, but also to preach the gospel. Wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Doug. So the sick need a doctor. So working at the clinic there in central Thailand, uh, meeting physical needs is a great bridge to meeting spiritual needs. And the problem is some people don't live near us. So we take mobile clinics and we do mobile clinics or we go out in the villages all over Thailand and heal the sick all over Thailand. Uh, it's a great bridge, but not everybody's sick, but some people need work. And so, like uh, Jules said, my wife runs Thai Country Trim, and for people who need employment, we bring them in, and uh, my wife runs a ministry where they do handcrafts, and so they can supplement their income. Some people already have jobs, so we go in and we teach English in the schools, and uh, we use the Bible as our curriculum, and use that opportunity to share the gospel with students all over the areas around us. So if they need medicine, we give them medicine. If they need employment, we give them that. If they need education, we provide that. Trying to provide all needs for all men so that by all possible means, we could see some saved. That's wonderful. Uh, hopefully what you're hearing is that people are using the gifts and the talents God gave them in order to leverage that for the sake of the kingdom. 
And it doesn't matter if it's somebody who is a basketball coach, as you saw with Mike May, if it's a teacher with Jules, if it's a doctor with Dr. Doug, it's using the gifts God has given in order to reach those who are around us. Okay, so this next question is coming specifically for Samuel. Um, You get a chance not only to see what God is doing locally in Albany, you, you live here, but you also get a chance to see what God is doing through much of the state of Georgia. And so the vantage point that you have is going to be different than probably everybody else sitting in the room. Um, So if you would take a moment, maybe the next probably three minutes or so, and share what do you see God doing in the area of church planting, and what is he doing on college campuses in the state of Georgia? So there's three words that I uh, want you to be aware as I speak. Networking, partnerships, and mobilization. That's what we're seeing across the whole state. Um, We're seeing churches coming together, partnering for the gospel just to reach the lost. Uh, We see a church plant uh, emerging, multi-ethnical, just to reach everyone for Christ. And um, I'm I'm excited because we we get to join in uh, on God and his endeavor and working with peoples and folks. And um, I I kid you not, I'm I'm pumped up, Paul. I'm pumped (laughs) up because we get to join God of whatever he's doing and um, across the whole, at least half the state, I see church mobilization, I see churches coming together. Uh, the last uh, report I have, um, a church in Columbus uh, united with another church up in North and did a whole VBS and connected with the community and 30 plus people came to faith for the Praise gospel the Lord. of Jesus Christ. And so now that's church planting, we've seen it across the state now. This excites me also because BCM, is, is part of that. Um, so I don't know if you knew this, but there are 40 campuses of BCM across the whole state. And out of the 40 campuses, we have 37 ministers um, in the campuses. We got seven full-time, eight part-time, and 22 volunteers. Listen to this. An average of 2,200 students in a weekly worship and Bible study are gathering together for the glory of God. Praise the Lord. You ready for this? It says in the past two months, record attendance in multiple BCM across the state has just been overwhelming good. 42 students have accepted Christ, and listen to this, 17 students responded to the call to ministry. So God is at work, guys. God is at work, and um, we're excited for that. So what it tells us is that God is at work in church planning and BCM across the city, state, the nation, all over the world. And why do you think? Because we are Christ followers and God is calling us to be an Acts 1-8 church, witnesses of Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's wonderful. Uh, To me, those are exciting pieces. When you think about the fact that a lot of times people are very um, negative on the next generation. They're like, is there gonna be any faithful followers of Jesus Christ? And then to hear of over 2,000 who are gathering weekly as far as for worship services and coming to faith in Christ. As a part of the church, we need to know that and be excited about it. Um, That is going to be the future leaders who are in our churches there. By the way, I don't know if you noticed or not, I was harassing Samuel before the service that uh, when you're with Georgia Baptist, you come up and you got your own insignia on your shirt. And and Les Sherwood has an iguana as our local mascot. I I don't have a good Sherwood shirt right now. So anyway, I have to harass Samuel a little bit. So, all right, this next one is coming down for John LaGrange. Now, John, your role in discipleship is very unique. So as you shared a moment ago, not only do you come alongside of the different ministry leaders right here at Sherwood, encouraging them and and trying to be a support for how disciples can be made at a um, strategic level within that ministry. But you're working with pastors right here in the city, churches in the city, churches in the state, churches in the nation, and then also churches internationally. So in many ways, you're kind of like the Swiss Army knife, so to speak, of, uh, of discipleship and missions. So if you would take several minutes and just share some of the things you're excited about that God's currently doing right now with This is the Gospel. Yeah, I think one of the things that we identified many, many years ago with This is the Gospel was that no matter where we went around the world, 
people needed help in discipleship. It didn't matter whether it was a, a local pastor in Bangladesh or it was a local pastor here in the United States or it was a sending organization, they desperately needed help with discipleship. And so what that did for us is it opened doors for us to walk through uh, to have impact with the gospel. And so for us, I think one of the big things that I've been excited about with This is the Gospel in the last year or so are the churches throughout Georgia that are embracing This is the Gospel. First Baptist Church Jonesboro started a men's home and launched it in September, and their curriculum, their pathway for discipleship is This is the Gospel. In fact, the pastor who uh, founded that and leads all that, he texted me this summer and he said, hey, uh, by the way, I'm in Malawi. Do you have discipleship materials for Malawians? I'm like, of course we do. And I emailed it to him, and that's what he used to teach for the three weeks that he was there. And so we're seeing other churches and ministry leaders take this as the gospel on their own, and they're furthering the gospel with it. And we're just kind of throwing fuel on the fire. So it's not just us at the end of the spear, it's so many others that are taking the baton. So that's an exciting piece. Hmm. It's exciting for me to hear some of the pieces that you're sharing because we've been there since the beginning, just watching the way God has developed that curriculum. And so uh, probably in the next month or so, there's going to be the new site that is rolling out and just so many of the updates on that. And we'll just have to wait until that time, but just know it is exciting to see what God is doing and how he is preparing that to go even further than what it is right now. So this next one is going to be for Jules on the panel, and then it's going to be answered by Mike May, Josh Wilson, and Virgil Brown. And this is one talking about calling. Uh, a lot of times people are wondering, like, how do you know God called you to either an area of missions or an area of church planting? And also remember, God calls people to be business leaders and farmers and teachers and everything else in between. But I want you to listen to this group as they just kind of share a little bit about that calling. So I'm going to start, Jules, with you. So share about that. How do you know or how did God affirm this call on your life? So the first piece for me what took place in college. Um, actually, I mean, I grew up at Sherwood. People would say, do you feel called to ministry? And I would be like, no, that's not me. Like, um, no. But I watched this movie in college called The Insanity of God, and it tells a story about missionaries in Somalia, they, how they worked with a persecuted church. And after I watched that movie, the Lord just pressed the word go on my heart. And I started to wrestle with that and asked the Lord, Lord, what does this mean? I asked my parents to pray. And someone, I was 19 at the time, and someone at the, uh, I'd heard say, a woman of God or a man of God knows the will of God through the word of God. And so I took that seriously and started to dig deeply in God's word and to read the word deeply. And through my quiet time one day and then actually through a phone call with a, um, a pastor, the Lord spoke clearly through Jeremiah chapter one. I was 19 at the time and I was like, Lord, you're calling me? Like, um, there, what if I stumble or I fail or I can't do it right? But in um, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 8 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then I said, this is Jeremiah the prophet, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say that I am, I am a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So that's kind of how the Lord has called me. And it's been a journey of faith and mm. walking by faith. But I've found the greatest satisfaction in walking in obedience to God. I'm going to tell you, we cannot get away from the importance of challenging and exposing young people to what God is doing around the world. I praise God for what he has done in Jules' life. And he's doing that around the church, around the world. He's calling people to certain areas of, of living out the gospel through the gifts and the talents that he's placed in them. So I want you to watch the same answers from three other guys. 
People have asked us, how did you know that you were called into full-time missions? Um, I personally believe that everybody, all of God's people have been called into full-time ministry. Uh, whether you're a pastor, youth pastor, missionary, or you're just a businessman, an accountant, a teacher, even a coach. God has strategically placed every single one of us in, a, in an area where we can uh, glorify him and have an eternal impact on the lives around us. He's given us all that area of influence. Uh, from there, it's just a matter of asking or answering the question, where? And I think that comes down to what passions God has put on your heart. Number one, um, what talents he's given you, asking the people close to you who know you well, what talents they see God placing in your heart, in your life, uh, what training he's given you, what doors and opportunities he's opened to you. And then for me, a big one is um, where can I have the biggest impact based on my training, my gifting, the opportunities that God has given me? Where can I have the biggest impact for his kingdom? Um, I've been amazed at the, over the last 16, 17 years at the platform God has given me to influence the world for, for Jesus through coaching and sports ministry. I would say three things. So one was an internal call. Um, it came from a, my own devotion with the Lord, opening up, reading through the Bible, um, going through the gospel of Matthew, coming to the Lord of the harvest passage and feeling like the Lord was placing a burden inside of me. Um, second would be affirmation from those around us. Yeah. Um, we didn't just make a decision on our end. We went, brought what we felt like the Lord was doing in our hearts yeah. to other people. Um, and they just affirmed it. They saw the passion, the vigor inside of us, what we really sense the Lord calling us to do. And so from there, we also went to look for the opportunity and where was the right spot. And again, brought that back to the people that were closest to us that were helping us determine and decipher where we were to go. So it was really just a, a call on our life, affirmation of where was the right opportunity that really led us to go plant. Man, that it's incredible that you're walking through those steps and you can clearly articulate that with others because yeah. it's not just, you know, I had a hunch, I had a right. feeling. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's always going to be more than that. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know it first. So I, um, was hungering for the Lord in high school. I became a Christian when I was 10. Okay. God saved me at 10, baptized at 13. By God's grace, walked with the Lord through middle school and high school. In high school, I got to see some of my teammates come to faith just through my own evangelism. And I had carloads of kids coming to church with me on Sunday. Loved it. And I was pretty content just doing that. Yeah. I had designs on being an engineer Okay. one day. And so I thought, I'll go to college to be an engineer, but I'll keep on doing this this Christian thing like as a side hustle. I'll stay really involved <laughs> in people's lives, telling them about Jesus, witnessing to teammates, and uh, being really active in my local church. Yeah. Well, the elders of my church said, Virgil, we really think you ought to pray about being a pastor. Mm. We just see how the Lord's using you, and we think maybe God has this for you in the future. And I said... I'll pray about it, but I don't think I'm the guy. I never thought I was good enough to be a pastor. I never thought I could measure up. So um, time goes on. I'm playing I'm playing ball. I love playing. And I have a serious relationship with a girl that I think I'm going to marry. Mm. The girl dumps me and I blow out my knee. And those things happen <laughs> pretty close to each other. It really humbled me. Yeah. And so for the first time in my life, I'm like 19 years old. And for the first time in my life, I'm actually uh, saying yes to the Lord mm. and saying, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I was broken. And uh, over a period of months after that, God started to make really clear to me that I was going to be a pastor, and that I should wow. pursue pastoral ministry. Um, so I did that. I changed course instead of majoring in engineering. I decided I'm going to study the Bible. Mm. I went to a Christian college. Met my wife there. We got married. I was involved with student ministries. Mm -hmm. And I, again, pretty content working with students, but also thinking, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. Yeah. So um, I started really being drawn to adult ministry mm -hmm. and wondering what that could look like. And this is the early 2000s. Okay. So church planting 
wasn't yet as big a deal as it is in some of our major cities now. There was no SIN network at the time. Yep. It was just me trying to find resources to learn about what it would look like to start a new church. And I stumbled upon some, and it mm-hmm. really ignited a, a desire with me, within me to be a church planter. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, but did you notice every time he hit the table, it sounded like Thor just thumped the table right there. <laughs> That was, that, that, that was a learning curve on my side. I had the camera set up on the edge of the table. After that, I was like, we're not going to do that again. So uh, anyway, but I want you to hear, this is going to be from Virgil as well. Um, I talked to him, and part of the interview just shared how his family had been involved in this church plant. And I want you to hear the story of how his 15-year-old daughter began to engage neighbors and teenagers who had no context for the gospel. They hadn't met Christians before. You just have to listen to what happened. And remember, this is in Portland. This is not in Indonesia. This is not in some other country. This is right here in the U.S. So let's roll this next one. If you could share that story, I just think it's a neat one for people yeah, to hear. Be happy to. So my daughter, all of us, 15, and when we moved into our neighborhood, she started telling her friends that she was a Christian and that her dad was a pastor, and they were curious about what that meant and what that was about. And all of us said, well, one of the ways that you can learn about this is by reading the Bible. We have Bibles as a church that we give away, and so she asked for a stack of those Bibles, and she gave them away to girls in our neighborhood and they started reading them and they came back to Olive and said, we're reading the Bible, but we don't understand any of it. And Olive said, okay, let's start a Bible study. So she started a Bible study in her backyard with girls from our neighborhood, explaining the Bible to them. They started in Genesis chapter one and they just started reading ever since then. I would prep her the night before and she would have her Bible study with them on a Saturday morning. Eventually it turned into like a potluck deal. So they're bringing dishes, they're making it fun. (laughs) It's really cool. And what was really eye opening for me is I was a little nervous because I'm trying to build relationships with my neighbors. They come over to my house, their kids go home with Bibles. Yeah. They come over to my house, and then there's a Bible study happening, yes. and I thought, "Oh no, right? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be ostracized." That didn't happen. Yeah, I just haven't found that there is that kind of hostility to Christianity here in Portland. Mm. So you were telling us as well. At one point, you look out your window, and you're looking down, and you're seeing your daughter with all of her friends sitting with Bibles in their hands yeah. in your backyard, yeah. doing a Bible study. Yeah. Uh, and then there was another piece there that you were describing as far as a movie night that yeah. they had. So tell us about that piece. right? Yeah. There. So for Olive's birthday, uh, one of her favorite movies is Overcomer. And she was eager to show this movie to her friends. And she said, Dad, for my birthday, I just want to take over the basement, invite all of my friends over and watch Overcomer. So that's what we did. And it really touched a nerve. It, 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 it hit home with the girls who came over that night. That, that's incredible, man. Yeah. I, I love it when it's not only the parents who were called to plant a church yeah. and to engage people with the gospel, but their children mm-hmm. understand the importance of that and mm-hmm. they're living on mission with God as well. That's right. That is incredible. So to me, I I loved sitting down and talking with Virgil just because he had story after story of just how his family is engaging people and everybody in different areas of influence. So for just a moment, this next one is going to be to Dr. Desta. And for many of you, you will recognize Dr. Desta. He's been here several times as a church. We have prayed over him. But I want you to hear just a moment about what God is doing through AIPM, the ministry that he leads there in Ethiopia. So let's watch this video. Mount Ambaricho was a ritual altar worship site for more than 500 years. But thank God that the last witch doctor, which is the 22nd generation one, became a Christian and this his worship site became the prayer movement and the missionary sending center. 25 years ago, about 300 of us gathered 
for prayer for prayer movement on the Mount Ambaricho, and that became an annual event since then. Today, by God's grace, we have plus or minus hundred thousand people gathering on every January 19th, which is Ethiopian Epiphany called Ethiopian Christian Holiday to pray for global evangelization. As a result of the ministry of our 453 missionaries during the last 19 years, that means since we commenced the ministry of AIPM, we have over 4 million people heard the gospel message of Jesus Christ through the ministry of missionaries and over 550,000 people came to Christ and we planted over 3,200 churches all over the country. Praise and glory to God Almighty for what he has done through the ministry of AIPM. Thank you so much. God bless you. It's amazing to see what God is doing. If you ever wonder, hey God, can you please meet this need? Can you please help in this area? A part that we didn't share on that is the ministry efforts, the missionaries, it began with a $5 donation from a teenage girl. 453 missionaries later, 550,000 people saying yes to Jesus began with a $5 donation from a teenage girl. God can use every little is much when God is in it. So this next one is going to go out to our entire group, and this is where we're going to end things. But I'd love it if you all would take a few moments, and I'm going to start down on the end. We'll work our way down. So, Ken, this one will come first to you. But if you would take a few moments and just share with those who are in the room, those who will be watching, like what are some challenges in your specific area of ministry, and how can we specifically pray? And, and before you start, let me just say, this is one that either take notes now or also know that uh, we'll likely go through and release this this next week. And it would be great to pause and to get a good prayer list out of this as to how you can pray specifically for the individuals here and the ministries they represent. So, Ken. Pastor, one of the challenges I see uh, as the church, I am so grateful for this church us going out and serving and seeing people. But I will tell you, the biggest need is people to disciple others. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest need. When I talk to young people, young boys, young girls, men, they are completely receptive to the gospel message and saying, can I get somebody to help walk me through this because I just don't understand it. And so as the church mobilizes, as we go out and we serve people, our biggest need is having people come alongside and disciple, seriously disciple other young people. The second thing is ask the Lord specifically if you could pray for wisdom. We are encountering different types of people in different types of scenarios every single day. We're seeing people on Wednesday, Thursday, sometimes Friday, Saturday, throughout the weekend. And we just need the Lord to give us wisdom on how we handle people. Because this is the one thing that we know. These are the Lord's people. And you better treat them with love and compassion. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we're saying, Lord, can you help us to know how to meet a physical need, how to share the gospel with them or minister to them and to pray for them. So we're just asking for the Lord's wisdom. Very good. John. I want to share a couple pieces with you to give you some context. By the year 20... 21, or excuse me, 2100, I'm sorry. Five out of 10 of the largest cities in the world will be in Africa. Three out of 10 will be in India. And one of them will be in Bangladesh, so you can put that whole area together. And then the other one will be in Afghanistan. So think about that, how population is growing at such a rapid rate. And then I want you to think about what it's gonna take to reach these people. And I say these people, that's in the 1040 window where we have a significant amount of the unsaved, unreached that don't even have access to the gospel. So our biggest challenge is ministry focus. And one of the things I learned from the IMB is there's six stages to um, the missionary components 
uh, of our work. One is entry, two is evangelism, three is discipleship, four is church formation, five is leadership development, and six is exit. Every single one of us in areas of service fall into one of those categories, and every people group around the world falls into one of those categories. So the key for us is to stay focused on the mission. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus outlines a whole bunch of pieces that are gonna happen before he comes. One of them relates specifically to our call. Our call is to reach every ethnos with the gospel, to stay focused. That's the biggest prayer that we need uh, with all our partners. That's the biggest prayer that we need together as a church to stay focused on reaching all the nations and then discern where each one of us fits in to those six categories. Samuel. So as I travel across the half a state or the state, um, there is a lot of challenges, Pastor, and um, I know I don't have time, but I'm just going to focus on the church planning and on the BCM church planning. Uh, we know and those that are, have been involved with church planning, it's hard. Church planning is hard, but we're asking, we're asking for prayer that God come around the church plant, and not only God comes around the church plant and calls them, but that the church comes around the church plant. And this is what I'm going to say. So we're modeling right now in 2024, we're going to be rolling out what it's going to be the mother church embracing a church planner that has been called, has a core team, and it's already thriving in the community. So the mother church, mother church is supporting that church, but also we're going to ask six to, sister churches, five to six Sister Church have come around that church plan also because in the past, 70% out of the church planning has failed, Pastor. Yeah. And the thing is that we need to be more effective, more diligent in the resources that God gives us. So we think, I, I, I say this, I, I say like when the baby is born in a home, the mother comes to place, the father, we embrace it, but then we see the grandmother, we see the uncles, we see the whole family coming around the baby. The church plan is just like that. The whole church body family coming around a church plan and making sure that it's being brought up uh, healthy uh, for God's glory. And so my prayer is for the church plan to have that support system, but also their hearts and their families' hearts. I mean, I mean, it's hard. And um, protecting their hearts, making sure that they are, they are fine and they're well and uh, detaching as the pastor preached this morning, it's always healthy and good. The second thing with BCM, is, I mean, God is calling stu college ministers, students to come in and step into the ministry role. We heard 17 have accepted the call and there's more. And um, probably your student or your son or daughter will be called to do something for God. And I mean, why not put fire, parents, put fire to it and um, just continue praying God and embracing that. So let's pray for our collegiate students and let's pray for our church planners that God continue working in them and through them for God's glory. Wonderful. Dr. Doug. Yeah, I have such a great opportunity in Thailand uh, in areas where there's no other witness. Uh, so often when I talk to people, I'm the only Christian they've ever met first Christian that they've ever met. But the opportunities are so great. They, they come in and see me in the office and we talk about their physical needs and then I can just share the gospel with them and, and I look in their eyes and they, they see their need hmm. to know the Lord. I, I go into uh, the schools and I, I teach them their English lessons and I, then I share the gospel with them and I look in their eyes and they, they see hmm. their need. We have people come into Thai Country Trim where my wife works and they come in for work and we share the gospel with them and they, we, we just have complete freedom to share the gospel with them and they, they see their need. And then the glaze of unbelief hmm. comes over their eyes over and over and over again. And I... Just day by day, I just look in the eyes of these people as I get to share the gospel time and time and time again. They, all we need, Lord, is for you just to take away their heart of unbelief. Mm. The, the opportunity is there. The, the gospel is presented. Their understanding is there. Your, per, your sermon today was very good for me. <laughs> and 
All we need is for you to take away their heart of unbelief. So if you would pray with me that the Lord would move across Thailand to dispel the heart of unbelief, Mm. that when they hear the gospel, they will grab onto the gospel to the saving of their soul. Yes. Jules. So there's been two kind of verses that have been running through my mind when I was thinking about this question. And Matthew 9, 37 through 38 says, The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then Hebrews eleven twenty six, talking about Joseph, it says, He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. One of the challenges we're facing on the mission field is we just need more help. Um, we look daily, like as Dr. Doug was talking about, of faces of despair and hopelessness. And many people, honestly, they're dying and they've never heard the gospel. Um, I've gone to my home and gotten on my knees and just wept and just said, Lord, please, can you please send people to help us? So please pray that people would surrender all. Pray that they would consider the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of this world and will look to the true reward found in Christ. One of the pieces that you all are going to hear us challenge in the next several years is if you have not had an opportunity to do some type of short-term mission trip, we want to challenge people to take that step. There is something about seeing what God is doing around the world as they're saying, sitting down and talking to someone who has never heard the gospel. You are the first Christian witness that they got a chance to meet. There is something powerful about the fact that in that moment, listen, in that moment of 8 billion people on the planet, God gave you the opportunity to be the first one to share the light of Jesus Christ. And that is not uncommon. So we're gonna be challenging people to take those trips. God begins to work in our hearts. And what you'll find is when you see what he's doing there, it opens your eyes to what he's doing right here. You begin to look at your local area differently. You're like, why are we not doing the same things here? And the issue is we can, 100%. But the issue has to be that God is the one opening our eyes and burdening our hearts for the mission that's there. I want you all to hear the last piece will be on the videos from others speaking in on this. So what are the greatest challenges we face? Um, I think anytime you step out in faith and try to do something significant for God's kingdom, you become an automatic threat to Satan and you will face obstacles, you will face challenges. I think one of the first things that Satan will do is he'll try to attack attack you in a way that steals the Spirit's work in your heart and steals things like your joy, your love, your your peace, your patience, your self-control. Um, sometimes those attacks come in the form of real physical obstacles or a person standing right in front of you. But I think one of the things that God's been working with, with Linda and I on is that Even in those situations, there's something deeper going on, and it's really a spiritual battle. Yeah, and we think that God gave us especially two tools to overcome those obstacles. Um, That's uh, reading the scripture and um, prayers. And I uh, yeah, just recently um, listened to a talk from Timothy Keller about Job. And um, yeah, he was just wondering, like, why God honored Job so much, even though the prayers that Job prayed were often filled with doubts and and complaining about a situation. And um, yeah, he was talking about it that, um, yeah, even though he was complaining, it was about that he did pray. So no matter how we feel sometimes, no matter um, what we say to God, it's the most important thing is that we do talk to God and that we do pray. So um, I think that's something that should be really encouraging for all of us that um, no matter if we feel like it or not, but we should stay connected to God and we should just pray. And I think that's why Mike and I really love our morning prayer walks <laughs> where we just yeah, like walk our dog and pray for whatever is happening in these days. But yeah, prayer is a really big way to overcome those obstacles.
And then like every ministry, um, one of the challenges is always resources. Um, this comes in the form of financial resources, obviously. It also comes in the in the form of personnel. You know, I've never seen a church with a sign out in front that says, no help needed. Uh, we're all in need of, of more people with a passion to serve Christ and to build his kingdom. Um, and obviously this mission, this ministry is no different. So for example, next summer, we would like to run two camps, one camp in the capital city of Lusaka and another camp up in the Copper Belt. Uh, but that means we're gonna need twice as big of a team. So um, you can just join us in praying in those two areas. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Some prayer requests that we would have would be for wisdom, that God would give us wisdom as we go about our each day, that we would make wise decisions, that we would be an encouragement to missionaries here, also to our workers, to our national people in the community. Also that we would stay focused on the work that God has for us, that we would not get sidetracked and get too busy, that we forget about the main reason we're here, is being part of a team to help reach the unreached people groups of Papua New Guinea. Another prayer request would be here in Papua New Guinea is called the land of the unexpected. And usually in the mornings we have our plans and daily routines that were jobs that day, but most of the time our jobs get changed or things come up that we just be flexible and learn how to um, adjust to the changes that come up that day. We just want to say thank you for your support. Thank you for your mm -hmm. prayers. We definitely feel your prayers through the different challenges we faced since we've been here. The challenge is Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries in the world because many effects like drought and war. Joblessness is rampant, which increases the gloomy situation of the country. But all these things are preparing the ground for mighty movements we are going to see soon. We have missionaries who are ready to go, but they can't they can't unless someone or church supports them. One missionary family needs about 300 US dollars for his monthly support. And we need at least 400,000 Bibles to, 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 to spread, especially for the gospel, uh, for the Orthodox believers. Finally, as Nehemiah declared, we also shout victory by declaring the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20. May God Almighty bless you all. Thank you so much. God bless you richly and mightily. Bye. I would say we have two that okay. I really feel right now. Um, the first one would be just when we're able to gather as a church. So right now we meet in the Fellowship Hall, which is essentially the basement of a 100-year-old Baptist church. And we have to which meet, is where we're at right now. Right now. That's right. This is, this this is where it. We're at. This so, is it. Uh, we have to meet at four thirty in the evenings, and that's just a barrier for us to serve our community in a lot of capacities. Yeah. And we really want to remove the obstacles for people to be able to come and experience. What I really believe that God's doing something here. That's right. And I want to remove the barriers that would keep people from coming here. Yeah. And having a Sunday morning service time, just from hearing the voices of the people in our community, that's the way that's going to help us best remove some of those barriers for people to come hear the that's gospel, right. but also to experience it, like just the presence of God and the sure. way that he's at work in amongst his people. Like you just want people to come in and be able to experience that right. as well. So service time, trying to find the right place for us to gather yeah. as a church that allows us to both grow as a church numerically, but also really have a deeper root, see the gospel take a deeper root in more people yeah. in our city. So that would be one. Um, the second one would be, at, we planted in the middle of the pandemic, yeah. which don't recommend to many people, you know? <laughs> but um, we that's what the Lord had for us, and he's been so kind that's for right. us to be able to meet people. We've seen people come to faith as we share the gospel with our neighbors. But there has been some of the carryover of the pandemic when it comes to like social barriers that yeah. we feel. And we just feel like we've hit a wall with yeah. some people. And just praying with us 
that some of those relational walls would be torn down yeah. and that we would be able to get in deeper with some of the people in our community that we really long to see come to know Christ. Um, those would be the two ways. I, I just want to see people come to know Jesus yeah. and be, be discipled in what it looks like to live the life that God has for us in relationship with Christ and then be able to disciple them and really like send them out. Like, but we need to, we need to get in relationally. Right. And so um, those would be the two things, it, the, the service time and just relational barriers with people and getting, That's getting good. to be a friend with them more. Well, man, we've just been talking for the last day or so just about what God is doing right here at Redemption. Um, just what it looks like to pastor and to shepherd people yeah. in a city that it's got so many incredible amenities and yet there's a lot of lostness. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you were telling me yesterday that uh, only 5% of the city is involved in any type of church That's on right. Sunday. So with 95% of a city that is engaged in other things, like there's an open mission field, but there's also going to be a lot of challenges that come with that. So maybe for a couple of moments, what do you feel like are some of the greater challenges for the gospel um, kind of ministering in a city like this? What are some barriers that if there's people praying at a partnering church, we could pray specifically for those barriers to come down? What do you think that would be? Yeah, good question. I think some of the barriers are going to be people just not having access to Christians, not mm -hmm. knowing many Christians, not having Christian coworkers. Or Christian neighbors and so not being able to ask questions yeah. or even receive invitations to attend a church service there are so many people who've come here to church for the very first time in their entire life yes uh, there was a guy who came to church one Sunday and I talked to him afterwards and he said I gotta tell you I thought I might burst into flames the moment I set <laughs> foot inside this church first time ever being in a church building we had pizza delivered here one day, and the delivery guy was so curious. He said, can I come inside? Can I look around? Had never been yep. inside a Christian church before. People who've never actually heard the gospel before. So we get to teach the gospel to people for the very first time and introduce them to Jesus Christ. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, but a barrier at the same time yes. in that um, uh, there's a lot that people don't know. And a lot of the cultivating work that hasn't been done in their lives to prepare them to hear the gospel, yep. um, which makes evangelism pretty difficult. I, I understand. Um, so you're describing people who for the very first time have heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I know with Sherwood being a church, it's in Georgia, it's mm -hmm. in the Bible Belt. Yeah. Uh, it kind of feels like everybody has heard the gospel at least half a dozen times, if not more. And just the thought of the fact that you don't have to even leave our country yeah. to engage a mission field with mm -hmm. people who are not only open, but they've just never even heard. Yeah, it's, it's a huge piece. So if there are people who are praying for you guys right now and the challenges that you're gonna be facing, uh, maybe in the next couple of years, just about seeing a church become a self-sustaining mm. church in a in a city that it does not exactly lean towards <laughs> the things of Christianity. Yeah. Like what are some ways that our church can come alongside of you guys and can just continue to pray about any and everything? Yeah, I'd say pray for the families in our church. So it can be difficult raising kids in a city like Portland. So Christian families need a lot of encouragement. Yeah. And they find that in community here with one another, but obviously a spiritual covering and spiritual encouragement through the prayers of the saints yes. will be much appreciated. So moms and dads are trying to figure out how do I bring up kids who love Jesus in a city like Portland? Mm -hmm. And how do I engage my neighbors while at the same time trying and shield my kids from some of the harmful things that are a part of the culture here That's in Portland? Right. That'd be a great way to pray. That's wonderful. Hopefully you all have at least heard tonight that God is at work, that God is doing some incredible things, that God is using people in everyday roles, the gifts and the talents that he has given them. Um, I am grateful, 
not only for the group who's joined us on the stage here tonight, but grateful for the partners that we got a chance to watch through video. We easily could have had 20 other groups represented on the stage tonight. And in future nights like this, we'll bring another group up and we're going to hear what God is doing at different levels. But as we close out, one, would you all just give those on the panel just a round of applause for uh, being here? And then I'm going to ask if Pastor Ken, would you close us out in prayer as uh, we're finishing for the day? Absolutely. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. God, we just thank you for being able to hear about the work you're doing all around the world. God, you're doing great things by allowing people to hear the great message of the gospel mm -hmm. and to know that they can be saved. And Father, you are opening so many doors for us to be able to do that, from Thailand to locally. This is the gospel in local and regional areas. God, we thank you for that. And so, Lord, as we pray and we leave this place today, Father, would you burn our hearts, just like the disciples who walk with Jesus, and as Jesus was talking, their hearts just burned. God, would you show us exactly where we need to connect, exactly how we can use our talent, skills, and abilities to further the kingdom. And Father, we'll be forever grateful. Lord, would you use us for your glory? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.